Good afternoon, everyone. I see we've got a bunch of people jumping in. Just gonna give everyone another minute. Hey, Marty. Hello, sorry about that. I had a little issue there. Still having some issues with some audio, so hang on here. Okay, we got Rachel on too. I think Rachel's everyone's like the most important person to everyone on this, probably. Rachel's from Iron Smoke. Yeah, so. hi guys. Hi. Feel free to turn your cameras on, guys. These are pretty interactive. We try to make them fun. Hence the happy hour time um, and, the, and the goodies that we send in the mail. So, Dan Staples, what is your picture of? That looks like an ice skating rink. That is my backyard. Ah, is it a nice <laughs> in, the, in the middle of winter, it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what picture I've got up because I rarely use Zoom, but <laughs> it, it's, uh, if it's an ice rink, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Okay, interesting. Are you, I'm in upstate New York. Um, I'm in uh, I'm in St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, okay. So you're the other Rochester, not Rochester, New York, Rochester. Uh, no, I think uh, Marilyn's trying to get in, and she just texted me. She's in uh, Rochester. Okay. She's in Rochester, Minnesota. Yeah, she must be down at Mayo today. Uh, well, it's still colder where you are than where we are most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can do it. No. I do it. I do it because we've got the lakes, and um, in the summertime, it's worth it. But I look at you guys as weather, and you have lakes too. And I don't know. I don't know. If I there, there's lakes in the south. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you... I'm I'm ready to go to those. <laughs> I'm starting my search now. Uh, it's horrible. We have a countdown for the days till we can be snowbirds based on the youngest, the senior year graduation from high school. Yeah. I'm not even talking snowbird. I'm talking permanent. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go buy my retirement home now before I retire. Leaving and never coming back. That's right. <laughs> well, well, I think a few minutes after we'll get started here. Um, I will just do some housekeeping and then we'll jump right into it. Um, we do have Iron Smoke on with us today. They, everyone should have received your deliveries. Um, they should have been delivered by the latest noon today. If you did not, please let me know. Um, go ahead and throw a note into the chat. If you didn't receive yours, I'll make sure that you do. Or if um, you were a straggler and getting your address to us, um, let us know that too. And I'll make sure they get out to you in the mail. I can promise you they're really good, the little tasting packs. Um, and then um, we'll get to that. We're going to jump into some information on Veeam and Comport Secure in regards to protecting your AWS data and why you can't afford to leave that unprotected. This is our second one in our little mini series. Our first one was for Microsoft data. Um, but I can tell you that by the response, um, it sounds like everyone has favors AWS um, over Microsoft Azure um, lately. We've had a lot of good conversations about that lately. So I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys how Beam and Comport Secure can help you today. Um, just do some introductions. I'm Hannah Coney, for those who don't know, Comport Secure Cloud Solutions Advisor. And I work very closely with the Beam team. My background is in backup um, data um, replication, DR as a service, and um, off-site data management and recovery. Um, so Marty and I worked together for a long time. Marty's a great resource at Veeam. He's their global cloud architect and a wealth of knowledge. So as we go, feel free to put questions into the chat. We will answer those um, after about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll transition over to Iron Smoke team. And like I said, feel free to um, interact with us, have your cameras on. If you have questions that come up as we go through this, please um, 
throw them into the chat, or if it's something that you think is uh, helpful for everyone, feel free to even ask us over the when we're in the middle of it. That's totally fine too. We like to be interactive. And we will review how you can seamlessly move apps and data to, from, and across AWS and other private and public cloud platforms. I know that some organizations use multiple platforms. We have some of our customers as we're a managed AWS service provider um, that prefer private and public um, hyperscalers um, in their own data centers. You'll hear about that, hear about how to recover quickly and to use multiple locations for your recovery scale, manage, and protect all of your workloads with Veeam from AWS, and then how to predict your monthly cost, which predict your cost and AWS don't really go hand in hand. I know that's a really big oxymoron. So if you have been using AWS for a while, you probably realize that pretty quickly. Um, we can be of help here. There's uh, ways in which we'll show you that coming up. Um, so don't forget about your bourbon, have that on hand. I have my glass next to me, and then I've got my Iron Smoke. Um, if you wanna start before we get to the Iron Smoke team, feel free um, to sip away and let's get started. I wanna review Comport Secure. So there's some people on here that I know I've talked to before. Hey, Rich. Um, there's, there's quite a few on here actually that I've talked to. Um, so welcome guys, and you might know about Comport Secure already, but for those who don't, we are a cloud services hosting and managed services division of Comport. So you'll see here I have four pillars on the screen. Um, I'm sorry, five pillars. And those five pillars are really the core um, backbone of Comport Secure. From there, um, you'll see that within them, there are lots of different little subcategories. I won't go through each one of those individually, but I do want to point out that we really work hard to make sure that as your business is evolving, as you're working on your IT roadmaps and your hybrid cloud strategies, that we're able to help you with that. So we have everything from hosting within our data center to a um, AWS Azure offering um, and sending you hardware to have managed in your own data centers. Maybe if you have your own and you don't want to manage the hardware um, or buy it on an CapEx schedule, you can um, consume that on a monthly basis, all the way through your backup and DR planning, DR testing and failover, um, networking and security monitoring to manage services and professional services. So making sure that your team feels supported, making sure that your um, needs, whether it be short-term, long-term, one-time, um, 24 by 7, 365 um, needs are there. We work with your team to become a part of your team and really help you navigate um, anything that pops up. Normally, we will tell you beforehand. Um, our team is very proactive and we really do enjoy working with your teams to really get under the covers and make sure that we understand everything in your environment. Our Comport um, slogan is, we care. And it's true, we do. So. Um, the, the the greatest trick ever pulled, and we know that you know this. I just learned that this is a movie or a um, a series um, snapshot the other day. So if you know what movie or TV series this is from, please put it in the chat because I did not know that, and I'm gonna have to go look it up and watch it after this. Um, but the greatest trick that ever devil ever pulled was convincing the world that cloud was cheap. Um, it's not cheap. It is not. Um, it's not cheaper than doing it on-site all the time. It can be, um, but the goal of the cloud, as it is um, a very broad term, really, um, I believe, was designed for optimization. So what does that mean? That means that you use it where you see fit and you use it where it will benefit you the most. Um, the, um, the cost of that really comes down to an ROI aspect. What are you going to be getting in return? For some of you, that might be a really great return on your investment, and for others, it might not be. So there's really no cookie cutter approach, and we try really hard to make sure that when we go into your environment, we're looking at it from your point of view and exactly how you use the data and how that data, whether it's available or not, and when you need it, how you get it, impacts your day-to-day -day workflows within your organization. <laughs> so. We know it's not cheaper, but we do know how to optimize it for you so that you have a really good ROI. So we're going to talk about that today with Veeam in regards to AWS. Um, Marty, I'm going to hand it over to you now um, to take a re quick review over the responsibility model. This is a pretty important slide for everyone. So we'll start here. 
All right, thanks, Hannah. So hopefully uh, everything's good. Uh, yeah, and uh, I haven't seen that movie, but I did know it was from that. And I like the little fact that it, it looks like he's got a, uh, it looks like his uh, tongue is pierced or something. There's like a little bubble coming out of his tongue there. So it's like a funny little picture there. <laughs> anyway, oh, I digress. Okay. So one thing <laughs> yeah. in the chat. I see that Rich West went to high school with the guy who wrote the movie and it's from The Usual Suspects. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I'll have to okay. watch it, yeah. I'll watch yeah. it, yep. Anyhow, uh, so backup, right? So you still need backup. So I like the little caption there and the, the concept of the cloud isn't really cheaper, right? But it, it has its purpose and its place. And it's just like anything else, right? Uh, it has its purpose and its place. And if you use it correctly, it'll benefit you and what you're doing. So. The key things to remember, though, is that it's still important to back up your data because one of the things that, that I, a slide that I use sometimes in some of my presentations is like, what is the cloud? Well, the cloud is really just a computer in somebody else's data center, right? It's not anything, it's not like some magical puffy thing up in the, up in the sky. It is a computer in a data center just somewhere else. And it's just a matter of how you provision it. That's really what the cloud is, is how is it being provisioned? And so when you look at it, whether it be AWS or Azure or Comport Secure even, no offense to the Comport people, but it's, it's a data in a server somewhere else. So if you look at what AWS has, their delineation here that says, hey, this is what we're responsible for, right? The availability zones, the hardware, the infrastructure, the storage, the compute, that hardware layer, is what they're responsible for. They're responsible for that piece of the puzzle. Everything above that is your responsibility. The operating system, right? The data, the data is the critical piece. Remember this, um, uh, this is something that we preach at Veeam from Danny Allen all the way down is data is the gold of today for businesses. Whether that data resides on a server or on the laptop of the CEO or even the laptop of whoever, sales guy running around trying to sell the business or trying to sell something, that data is the corporation's responsibility and it's the corporation's value is that data that's out there. So it's very key to back that stuff up to have it protected, right? And you want to make sure you do that. It doesn't matter where it's hosted. You want to protect it. Um, so, okay, oh, yeah, cool. All right. So with Veeam, there's a couple different things to keep in mind when you talk about a cloud, right? So when we're talking about whether it's AWS or it's Azure or it's a hybrid approach, uh, there's AWS native backup and then there's Veeam backup and replication, which we've had for a long time. And the two work hand in hand simultaneously as we go through, uh, I'll talk about why they work together and how they work together. And, uh, and we'll discuss that in more detail. So cloud native approach, first of all. So with the AWS product, it's cloud native, right? We're using AWS tools. It's agentless backup in AWS using AWS's APIs. And we can back up EC2 instances and RDS instances. And it, it's a policy-based automation. So what we're using there is we're using a policy-driven approach. We can use tags to say these things are automatically backed up. What policies are being put into? So for example, maybe I've got certain things if I'm using the cloud correctly, that spin up and spin down when they're needed, right? So I could tag those so that they automatically get added in the Veeam policy and which policy they get added to. So while they're running or whether they're not running, Veeam is gonna back them up in a certain uh, manner and store those in a certain way, right? So it's very key to understand that and how that works. You can go ahead. You went backwards there. No problem. <laughs> so the other thing is application consistency. So that native approach is application consistent, right? We're going to capture everything that's running in that system, in that EC2 instance or that RDS instance, and we're going to make sure that it's consistently uh, with the log so that we have those transactions, well, then there's nothing in flight that's lost. The other thing that the fact that we're using the native approach with APIs is it's lightning fast recovery back to AWS. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But if I'm recovering back to AWS, because I'm storing it as a snapshot, I can recover it very quickly back within seconds on some things that I can put it back into AWS. And I can recover the entire instance. I can recover specific volumes. I can recover specific things inside of a database. I also have the ability to recover the VPC 
and individual files. So all the way down from, just like I can with Veeam on-prem with VMware, I have the ability to do multiple different types of recoveries depending on what I'm looking for. I can recover everything from the EC2 instance or the RDS instance all the way down to specific files, put them back where they were. I even have the ability to recover the VPC in case something happens to that as well. Okay, as part of that product, with the uh, policy, I can do a cost calculation. Now, this cost calculation is looking at how much it's going to cost to store the backups. Now, with the native product, there's two parts. There's a snapshot part and a backup part. So when I say store the backups, I'm talking about storing the snapshot and the backup in, EC, in S3, okay? So the cost calculation can say, hey, based on your policy. So for an example, maybe my policy says store the snapshots for 14 days and store the backups in S3 for a year. And it'll give you a calculation to say, this is what it would approximately cost you to do that for the storage. So it might say, hey, it's going to cost you this much for the snapshots in EBS, this much for the backups in S3. And then you can adjust from there. If it's too much money, hey, maybe I can talk my managers down to 10 days of snapshots and six months in S3 or something to that nature based on what I'm looking at from a cost perspective. But at least it's going to give you some visibility into what that snapshot and backup is going to cost you. Okay, another key piece of the puzzle is the cross account and cross region. The reason why this is key is I can separate my backup account from my production account and I can have it in a different region so that if something happens to the production AWS account, I have a backup account that doesn't get compromised or doesn't get hit with ransomware or it has a completely separate component, right? And then I have the ability as well to send it to a different region. So in case something happens to that AWS region, so maybe I run my production in AWS in uh, US East, which is Virginia, something happens to Virginia, I might send uh, my snapshots to US West, somewhere on the West Coast, and I can run over there. I also have the ability to to put the workloads into something like Comport Secure. Again, I have the ability to recover those workloads in and out of AWS. So not only do I have the ability to do them into AWS in multiple regions, but I also have the ability to copy those out and recover them somewhere else, for example, like Comport Secure. And again, all of that is being done with the RESTful APIs inside the uh, AWS product. And because I'm using APIs, I can do some other automation as well. So if you wanted to kind of call some things and have it done automatically outside of the Veeam tool itself, you have the ability to do that programmatically with those APIs. Marty, is it just as simple to move data back out of a Comport Secure Data Center and when the time comes? It, it's simple from the fact of doing the restore component. So the, inside of Veeam, I have the ability to restore the workload in the AWS, in the Azure, in the Comport Secure, or vice versa. How long it takes to do that restore is going to depend on the size of the machine, right? So the larger the, the instance, the larger the VM, the longer it's going to take to do the restore because it is a full restore. So a little bit different than Veeam's normal backup with the instant VM recovery. Here, we're going to do a full restore. And if I'm doing a restore, something like, say, from VMware to AWS, Veeam can do it, but we have to convert it, right? We're going to convert it from VMware into an AWS EC2 instance. So it's time to restore and time to convert. So just be aware that there is time to do that. Same thing coming out of AWS. So if I have a workload in AWS, it's very easy inside of Veeam to recover that to a VMware environment, but just be aware of the timing. It actually is a little bit easier there because I could do an instant VM recovery in that case and I have it up and running right away and then do a migration. So it's actually a little bit faster to take stuff out of AWS into something like Comport Secure or other VMware environments than it is to go the other way. Awesome. Okay, so here's where they're kind of connect, right? The two, the two roads meet together. So I have the AWS native product we've been talking about so far that's all in AWS, runs only in AWS. When I connect that with Veeam backup and replication, which is the on-prem, which we've known about for Veeam for a long time, when I marry those two together, I now have the ability to, again, move that data around. 
right? So we've just talked about this a little bit. I have the ability to recover those AWS workloads in Comport Secure, into a data center, right? Into VMware, into Hyper-V, maybe into Nutanix, into the other A cloud, right? <laughs> I have that portability to move that data around when I combine it. So with the AWS native tool by itself, the native backup does a very good job of backing up AWS and recovering to AWS. When I put that together with the Veeam backup and replication on-prem component, now I have the ability to copy those backups from AWS to Comport Secure and then recover there as well if I want to. So when I put those two together, I get that true portability of that data, that hybrid cloud, and I have single visibility. So that common control plane of now I have a central location. And again, if I have a hybrid cloud environment, it's great because I have the ability now with inside of Veeam to see what's going on at AWS. If I have Azure workloads, I can see what's happening with Azure workloads. And if I have workloads in Comport Secure, I can see those as well. And I can back all of those up from the same product and manage those policies from one place. All right, so I'm gonna backtrack a little bit here. RDS, VCP, and EC2 backup, right? So we talked about this a little bit. We do have the ability to back up those products. So RDS is a relational database, EC2, and then we actually can do the VCP as well. That's very key. The reason why VPC is very key is that typically that's where ransomware is going to wipe you out, right? I might be able to wipe out the EC2 instance, but if I wipe out your VPC and Amazon, that's a bigger issue right? Because trying to recover that, that's got security controls, it's got networking and subnets and security groups, and it has uh, all of those components to it. So it's very key to be able to recover that VPC configuration data as well, right, for, uh, for that workloads. Now, again, I'm not going to take a VPC and Amazon and recover, that's a VMware, right? So that is an AWS only recovery, but it's key that that's protected. So it's very, very good that, that we added that in the last uh, edition of the product, which is version three now. Okay, we also added the ability to do role-based access control. So now I can delegate certain roles and responsibilities. So if I've got, maybe I've got a, a huge workforce and I have a big IT staff and I want certain people to be able to do certain things, certain people back up certain workloads. So maybe I've got a specific uh, backup admin for my HR and payroll uh, instances in Amazon. And I only want them access to that. And I don't want my other backup guys to see that information. So I have the ability to do some role-based access there inside of that product and what they can back up and what they can't, what they can see. And again, we've added the file level recovery and now it's been enhanced. So prior to version three, when I did a file level recovery, what I was really doing was recovering individual files to the machine I was running the recovery from. So for example, maybe I was running the recovery on my laptop. It would actually recover the file to my laptop and then I would have to upload it back to the server. Downside to that is, is when I upload it back to the server, it would lose all of its ACLs, right? Because it's, it's basically like a new file that's been uploaded. Now I have the ability to recover the file back to the original location with all of the original ACLs and all of the uh, original time frame and anything else from a file standpoint. So it's been a big enhancement for that component. Okay, I have the ability to exclude volumes. So maybe I've got a machine. Uh, here's a great example. If I'm not running RDS, I'm running SQL Server inside an EC2 instance, and maybe I have a drive. One of my EBS volumes is for the logs, <clears throat> and I'm backing up the logs another way, uh, or maybe I'm sending log backups to a specific EBS volume. I don't need to back that up. I can exclude that from the policy. All right, These, this is where I like to do this because just so you guys are aware, I this whole webinar thing, like it's, we're doing it. I'm more of an in-person. <laughs> I like to whiteboard things. So to me, this is like the best option here from a whiteboarding standpoint because I can talk about it, right? So when I look at the cloud, I've got the AWS cloud 
and the backup account. So I can see here what my production account is. And I said this a little while ago to have that separate backup account in case my production account gets corrupted, right? So the production account is running all the EC2 instances, the EBS volumes, the EBS snapshots, the RDS instances, and the VPCs all being managed and taken care of by the production account. The backup account has the ability to see that information, to take those snapshots, to manage those snapshots, and then also move those snapshots, convert them to a Veeam backup file, and store them in Amazon S3. And the reason why it's important to know that that's a Veeam backup file, right? If you're familiar with Veeam, you know we store our backup files as VBK files and VIBs for incremental backups. The fact that it's a Veeam file is what allows me to copy that backup to another location, and we'll show that in another diagram, right? But this is how basically how it works and what it looks like visually. So you can see the workers there that Veeam uses will spin them up and spin them down to manage those snapshots, can convert them to backups in S3. And we just, we spin them up and spin them down as needed. So it will scale as needed, just like everything else in the cloud, right? I can spin them up, do what I need to do, shut them down, it's all automatic. Okay, so here again, just kind of going a little farther. Now I'm taking that to another region. So you'll see here, I've got my production account in region A, then I can do my snapshot replicas to region B. Again, still being managed by that backup account. So even though the production account has visibility to everything, the backup account is actually what's managing it. And that's kind of why we have that separate color there because the color is showing you what is being managed by the account versus what's actually happening inside the, uh, in the account. But there we're replicating those snapshots to another region, right? Sorry, Hannah. And then here is looking at a visual representation of recovering in the AWS. So like I said, the native tool is going to do snapshots and recover back to AWS very quickly. So what happens here is this is where that number three bullet kind of goes up. So what I can do is if I'm doing a snapshot and I need to recover the EC2 instance, something happens to it, it gets hit with ransomware, it gets destroyed, you know, accidental deletion, whatever happens, I can recover it back into EC2 very quickly. Right, so just from the snapshot. Think of it like a storage snapshot on a SAN array. I can take the snapshot, something happens, I can recover it very quickly. I also then have the workers that converted it to a Veeam backup file, and I can recover from that Veeam backup file for the longer term. Now be aware that that recovery for the number four is gonna take a little bit longer because now I'm not doing a snapshot recovery, I'm doing a backup recovery. So I actually have to recover the data out. So it's more, it is a longer recovery, but again, it could be from a longer term uh, storage as well. And then I believe there's one more, I'm trying to get you guys to your bourbon and I'm trying not to hold you out, you know, because I know what's important, not me. It's, I'm not the important thing. The bourbon's the important thing, right? You gotta have that, that uh, the bourbon for sure. All right. So last slide to talk about here is how to take the backups now and put them somewhere else, right? Because what happens if I decide to either get out of Amazon or Amazon, it's a corporate policy that I need to get my data into another data center, right? So think about uh, when you had your data center on-prem, you had to get your backups somewhere else. So same thing here with Amazon. I don't want to just keep my backups in Amazon because uh, that would be the same thing as me keeping them on my data center on-prem. So I've got the same idea, same concept, snapshots to S3. And then because I integrate with Veeam Backup, Veeam Backup can see those backup files, right? I said they're basically the same backup file sitting in S3. I can copy those backups now to Comport Secure's data center. They're sitting in Comport Secure data center. It allows me to recover those back into Comport Secure as a VM. Or you'll notice there I have the ability also to recover them over to Azure. So it's really where I get that hybrid approach to not only running workloads, but protecting workloads and recovering workloads. Oh, and okay. questions, comments, thoughts, or just let's get the drinking bourbon. <laughs> let's see here. We've got we've got a couple questions. First one: Do I have to back up to AWS before sending it to Comport Secure? Um, okay, so I think this person has if they have a production environment in AWS, 
do they have to back it up with AWS before backing up to Comport Secure? I'll let you answer that, Marty. Yeah, so there's two ways to do this. And, and the answer to one is yes. The, the answer to the other answer is no. So with the native product, if I'm doing the native AWS snapshot uh, product, then yes, I have to actually do a native snapshot and then a native tool to put the backup in S3. And then from there, I can take that from S3 and copy it to Comport Secure. So that's, that's one way to, to take care of it, right? And that's all the native product. The other option I have is if I have a smaller environment or if I want to go directly to somewhere else, I could run the Veeam agent in Guest. So the Veeam agent for Windows, Veeam agent for Linux uh, is installed inside the operating system and that can go directly to Comport Secure. Okay, but it's a little bit different to manage it. So the nice thing about the native tool is I can manage a bunch of instances from one place through a policy. Agents are going to be managed basically independently and managed on, on, on each one individually. So it just depends on the size of the environment and what the end goal is. Awesome. Thanks, Marty. Um, last actual question that I see here, and that is, can they receive a demo of replication of your replication slide? Uh, probably. Why? Let's do this. Why don't I reach out and try to schedule some time after the webinar? Um, you can do that. For anyone yeah. who would like to see a demo, and we can actually show you, Marty, if that works for you. That will work as well. Yep. Yeah, I went into my AWS account today and I haven't had it running for like 30 days so the license is expired. Who <laughs> did oh, you? Because cool. I like to keep my, my costs down so I don't run, I don't keep anything running. I shut it all down. You mean every minute it's open, that portal's open, you have to pay? Uh, yeah, pretty much that's the way the cloud works. <laughs> that's cheaper. Um, cool. Thank you, Marty. Um, I think, let's just let me double check here. Yeah, I think we're ready to move on to Iron Smoke. Um, uh, if you, like I said, if you didn't get your tasting samples in the mail, let us know. I've got mine. Um, I'm actually going to, um, I sent out all the sample packs because you guys um, really wanted to try some of this stuff. So I've got my bottles um, next to me today because we're big Iron Smoke fans in this house. Um, so I am going to hand everything over to Rachel, who's on um, from, actually, Rachel, let me see if I can pin you. We'll see if there. Hopefully everyone can see you. Um, and I'll let her take it away from there. Uh, hi guys, so I am Rachel. I'm the regional brand manager with Iron Smoke. Um, if you guys don't know about us, we are a farm distillery. We are based in Fairport, New York. It's about 10 minutes outside of Rochester. Everything that we get for our bourbon, our whiskeys comes from within the state. Basically, that's what a farm distillery is. I know that a lot of you do know who we are. Um, Tommy Burnett is the founder. He wanted to combine two of, two of his favorite things, which would be bourbon and barbecue. So the reason that we're a little bit different than a traditional bourbon is, one, we're a high wheat content bourbon. Most bourbons are a high rye content. We're a 65 corn, 30 wheat, and then rye and barley on the back end. Second reason we're a little bit different is we actually do... Applewood smoke our wheat. So with the bourbon on the front end, you'll get some sweet caramels, vanillas, toasted marshmallows. The back end, you're going to get that subtle hint of smoke. With our bourbon, uh, we are three char on the barrel. So we do have that little happy medium. But I'm not going to make you guys hold out any longer. I mean, if you already started sam sampling, I don't blame you. It's been one of those like weeks, I think. So first, I know you guys did get the bourbon, so we will start with the bourbon here. Um, it's going to be, again, a 65 corn, 30 wheat, and then a mixture of rye and barley. Again, applewood smoked wheat. On the front end of this one, right on the nose, you're going to kind of get a lot of that sweetness from the corn, um, because again, we'd use a high corn content as well. Um, most of you probably do know, but in order to be a bourbon, it has to be at least 51% corn. So we use 65, so we're kind of a little bit above that, you could say. So you're going to get a really sweetness off the nose. And upon the first sip, again, on the front end of this, you're going to get some of those toasted marshmallows, the vanillas, the caramels. The back end of this, you are going to get a subtle hint of smoke. Your first sip, it may be a little bit strong. 
So you might want to let it kind of settle in and let your taste buds adapt to it. Once they do that second sip, you'll definitely get that, that nice smokiness on the back end, but it's not like an aggressive scotch smoke. I mean, I obviously already know what this tastes like, but you know, when in Rome. <laughs> now, Rachel, I was told you always have to take two sips because the first sip sets your belt. The second one is when you actually taste it. Yeah, so the first sip again, your taste buds need to adjust to any bourbon. Whether it's an iron smoke, a old forester, a Woodford, even like a Pappy. Like I've had a 15 year Pappy. And you know, if you guys are bourbon drinkers, Pappy is like the holy grail. I will say it's not, <laughs> it's not horrible, but it's definitely not that great. My first sip, I was like, oh, it's a little bit harsh, but your taste buds have to adapt to it and you have to slowly like integrate it in. Another suggestion I have is some people are not bourbon drinkers. Um, I run a bourbon blog now. I can tell you about five years ago, I would not touch bourbon. I thought it was vile. I hated it. So awesome tip with bourbon, especially ours, since it has a little bit of smokiness. You can do a Manhattan with this guy. The smoke comes on the back end of this one out of a Manhattan. Or since we're in like the summer season, a nice bourbon lemonade. One of my favorites to do is to muddle in some strawberries and a little bit of basil and then use like an unsweetened or like a 50-50 lemonade with the bourbon. It kind of helps your taste buds to adapt to it and really start to appreciate it. Um, so that's pretty much a lot of my friends are not bourbon drinkers. That's how we get them on the bourbon wagon, but always give it at least that two sips. Your taste buds need to adapt to it. I thought Rosie's was going to get everyone on the bourbon wagon. <laughs> yeah, Rosie's is a good way to get everyone on the bourbon wagon. I'll say that too. So we'll head into Rattlesnake Rosie's which you guys want to make sure that you actually shake this up before you pour it. I'm not sure if the little 50 ml say um, shake it, but right on the top of this one, it says shake the snake, like rattlesnake, um, because this guy's going to be made with our unaged corn whiskey. Um, then we actually put uncut, unfiltered apple cider in it. Then we distill it with cinnamon sticks, brown sugar, and vanilla. Now with this one, it's funny because our master distiller had been making this illegally from the age of 18 on. And he actually was making it for different farmers and doing a lot with it and they loved it. So when we found him, he kind of told us about it and we were beyond blown away when we tried it. It's amazing, it tastes like an apple pie in a glass. So this one, it's gonna be a little bit thicker. A lot of people think of it as a moonshine, but it's still a 70 proof whiskey. We didn't wanna compromise the integrity of the whiskey by adding flavoring. So we actually didn't do any flavorings. We did actual apple cider in this one. This is for like the whiskey drinker that doesn't like whiskey. That's my best way to put it. A lot of people like it on their ice cream, but on the front end of this, you're gonna get that real crisp apple flavor. The back end, you're gonna get all the baking spices and it's gonna marinate into the perfect little apple crumble, apple pie. It's fantastic. It is my favorite. It is how I started to enjoy yeah. um, bourbons. But I will say that if you're a Manhattan person, um, it is really good to add a just a splash in your Manhattan. Yes. Oh, I'll have to try that actually, because I've never tried that in a Manhattan. Um, we have had a maple bake in Manhattan. Some of you guys don't know either. We do have other products. We don't make them in the 50 ml yet. So we do have our casket strength. This is gonna be the same exact mash bill as our bourbon. However, it's aged a little bit longer. You can kind of see by the bottles how different the, the distillate looks. It's a lot darker. This is uncut, unfiltered. We actually take it, we hand strain it with a strainer out of the barrel, out of the barrel right into the bottling line. It goes in at 120 proof. It does not drink like a 120 proof. It drinks like a 90 proof. This is dangerous. This is my favorite product that we have. It actually is on allocation status as well. So we only release about 90 bottles of it a month. When it's gone, it's gone. The other one that I wish we had the 50 mLs in is this. It is our maple bacon with Lulu the pig on it. Now this guy's really unique. It's actually made with our unaged corn whiskey, again, but it's made with 100% pure maple syrup from New York State. And then it's a strain of yeast that smells and tastes like bacon. So if any of you guys are vegan, vegetarian, it is vegan and vegetarian friendly. We did try and use a bacon wash, but you know, a bacon leaves that like residue and grease, it left it <laughs> all inside the bottle and it looked horrible. This smells, tastes like bacon. If you guys are Bloody Mary fans, a maple bacon bloody is fantastic. 
or we made a cocktail called a leftover lua with this pineapple juice and a little bit of grenadine and it's honestly like a pig roast like in a cup it's amazing it's so good but all of our products if you guys are interested in trying them you can definitely go to our website and order them because i don't believe they're in a lot of your areas um we do sell everything and ship it from the distillery so that's always an option um does anyone have questions concerns anything like that curious what is the biggest difference between the casket strength and the straight like what would you say is the biggest difference and why would you use if you were mixing um for cocktails why would you use one or the other so the biggest difference between the two of these um is going to be again these are the same distillate 65 corn 30 wheat and then rye and barley this one's proof down not proof down Biggest difference to me is this one has like a savory peppercorn on the back end of it. This one has a smokiness. I definitely think the smokiness comes out in the bourbon. This one, it's a more, it's a very unique finish. It's one of my favorite bottle or barrel proofs that we've done so far and tried. We've done a few of them, but this one was the one that stuck around. If I was making a cocktail, I guess it depends on what kind of cocktail. So my go-to bourbon cocktail is a New York Sour, which is going to be two parts lemon juice, one part simple syrup, and then one part bourbon. You kind of mix that up with an egg white if you want to, and then you float like a sweeter red wine over it. I like the stronger one, the casket strength, because I think the flavor comes out more. The bourbon's great, but it has a little bit of smokiness, and with like that sweet, sour, and smoky, it's just too much. If you're doing an old-fashioned, 100% go with the normal bourbon, because again, that smokiness adds something to it. There's not like an overpowering other flavor in it that it would mask, if that makes sense. You guys um, have some of the recipes you mentioned online? We do. On our website, like the Maple Bacon Bloody, um, we have the Manhattan. We call it an Iron Manhattan, so we do have those. Um, I can always get them over to you guys as well. I know I have my own, like, choice cocktails that I do with these. Um, one of the distillery's favorites is actually going to be the two that we sent to you, the bourbon and the apple pie, we mix them together with a splash of bitters and then an orange peel. And it's honestly, it's fantastic. And it's like the go-to cocktail, but everything is on our website. And I'm sure that Hannah could, you know, share my email if need be, if you guys want to go back and forth. I'm happy to give you guys some of my favorite cocktails. I even bake with these. I make cookies with these. I'm like, I'll use the apple pie as like a glaze. The maple bacon on the back of it, it literally says perfect on pancakes because you open that bottle and it's like smoky maple syrup. It's it's amazing. Oh, that's I want to I want to hear from anyone on here who has it on their pancakes this week. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, mean, yeah, I usually do like sugar-free <laughs> maple syrup, but I mean if I'm having a good Sunday brunch, I'm like, all right, we're putting it in the Bloody Mary and on the pancakes. <laughs> I love that. Right. Um, Anyone else out there? I know Aaron's like in the apple pie one right now, Rosie. Anyone else out there? Anyone? <laughs> you mentioned about the um, the apple pie one in particular. You said that's a good, uh, almost, a, I hate to say it, almost like a gateway drink um, for is. people who don't like bourbon. Yes. Um, what are some ways, because I know a few people who would even be apprehensive just to try this. Uh, what are some ideas as to try and get them to get a chance to enjoy it? With the apple pie specifically, with autumn just around the corner and like Halloween is my holy grail holiday, this one, honestly, if you just mix this with apple cider, it tastes like the cider does. I know here in Buffalo, we have a cidery called Mayer Brothers and they do apple cider slushies. This is awesome in a slushie. This also, since it's summer, instead of doing um, vodka in a mule, you can do an apple pie mule. I like to get really fancy and put like cinnamon sugar around the rim and like a cinnamon stick, but you don't have to. Another thing is I'm not a tequila drinker. I am when I go out and someone makes me take a shot, but as a whole, I am not a tequila drinker. However, you can actually put this in a margarita mix and it takes the place of the tequila and it's like an apple pie margarita. It's really, really good. Or even that, if you just take this and put it over the rocks and just don't tell them. <laughs> like, I'm horrible like that. I'm like, yeah, there's so much <laughs> No, I didn't. They... But if you're trying to ease them into it, apple cider or even apple juice, 
great. Or you can do an apple pie mimosa with it too. Do this, a little bit of the Prosecco and maybe top it off with a little bit of apple juice or cider. That's been a really easy way to integrate it into people's drink choice. Because again, my friends are all vodka drinkers. Um, it's hard. People either love whiskey or they hate it. But I'm genuinely, I'm sold on the fact that if you try something enough, you'll honestly incorporate it in and your taste buds will adapt to it. I was told once that if you try something eight times, your taste buds adapt and you won't hate it anymore. And I've kind of found that to be true for myself too, because I used to not eat pork and now I love it. But, you know, it kept getting like forced on me. But it's just, I think, finding the right cocktail that works for somebody, or especially if you have an individual that says, hey, I usually drink like, vodka tonics try a little bit of that with tonic in it and yeah. honestly just do a little bit and just slowly integrate more into it sure. you need shots you. of tequila though, like tequila if well, i understand it. <laughs> i i will say like i i'm a trooper i'll do it but i'm not gonna be happy about it and i'm i'm not gonna have a good night we but i will, right I will do it I'm sorry. We have to find you the right tequila. You, well, I don't. So I do like mezcals because they're smoky. So I'm like, you know, everyone's like, you got to try the Anejos. You have to try yeah, the yeah, yeah, And I'm right. like, yeah, yeah, I'm just not trying to deep dive into that yet. Um, <laughs> maybe eventually, like when I have a free night of I'm willing to not feel great the next day. I'm like, but it was my birthday last week and I, I had enough excitement for like four days. So I'm like <laughs> laying low right now. So we're going to stay away from the tequila for a little. Now, I, I live with a whiskey and bourbon connoisseur, hence um, why we are at Iron Smoke and we love Iron Smoke so much um, because it's one of the best ones locally. Um, but he will sometimes add a splash of water. Yes. What, and I know that that releases or breaks up the molecules. Is there any... Have you done that with the iron smoke ones? So you can basically, when you put a piece of, like a single piece of ice or a drop of water, you're basically opening it up and opening up the flavor profile. A lot of people swear by that, but we'll do ice because ice is pretty much the purest form. I haven't because I'm a very like just whiskey neat drinker. I don't like it on the rocks. I've done it with a few like barrel proofs. I've done it with the, the casket strength um, to where like, you know, it's, it's got some heat to it, but it's for being, again, a 120 proof. It drinks like a 90 proof, but it just opens up that flavor profile. And I think that you get more of the tasting notes on it versus if you're just drinking it straight, you're going to get the same tasting notes the entire time of it. If you add something to it, oh, did we lose our expert? Did you guys? Am I caught? Oh, she's back. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, what is happening? We lost like a sentence. Yes. Okay, yeah. So basically, again, like that's just opening it up. That's just opening up the flavor profile. Your palate, again, is going to change a little bit. And with every sip of something, it's going to change a little bit more. And I think that you're going to get more of the tasting notes on it. And even on the nose, I found that too. When I first got into like drinking bourbon, I was like, this just burns my nose. Like I don't like it. But also the way that you tilt the glass and how you like breathe it in, you kind of keep your mouth open and breathe it right back out. It helps you to get all the, the flavors on the nose. Like, you know, what kind of wood it is, what kind of fruits you're getting on it, whether you're getting a floral note of it. There's so many different notes and stuff like that. And I think I like iron smoke because it's, it's a lot sweeter with like the dried cherries and the toasted marshmallows and the caramels, vanillas, toffees. Oh, Bennett put his glasses on. I think he's reading. He's getting really into it now. We're getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I have to say the uh, the apple pie, uh, uh, amazing. I can't wait to. It tastes like a little apple pie in a glass. It's crazy. Honestly, when I do in-store tastings, if I get like a, a man, his girlfriend, his wife, whatever, and she's like, I only drink vodka. I'm like, let me have you try something. I usually keep it chilled. I'm like, I promise you will not hate this if you do spit it out. You don't have to drink it. She's like, well, it's actually really good. I'm like, yeah. It tastes like an apple, not even an apple pie to me. It's almost like an apple crumble that like you get a lot of the spices on it. And, like you could taste those crumbles. It's fantastic. You said something there. You said you usually keep it tr uh, chilled. Is, is, I is do. that probably the best way to do it? So I prefer it chilled. Some people like it warm, but honestly that like on the rack sitting outside when it's hot out is just great. And like 4th of July weekend, I was like, what's more American than apple pie? Like nothing, <laughs> nothing is. 
So I try to drink it chilled when at all possible. I used to be a big wine, a port wine drinker for like late night sitting by the fire outside in the summertime. Yep. Now yep. it's, yep, I've replaced it with the rosies on the rocks. Yep. Yeah, honestly, like sitting around the fire, I'm like, just picture yourself like around a campfire with your friends. You don't have to mix it with anything. If you don't want to drink a beer or seltzer, this is the next best option. It really is. Awesome. You want to have any other questions for Rachel, how it's made? Um, anything about Iron Smoke? I love the logo. It's like <laughs> our little skull. Like cool those barrels. And I see them all over town. I see them in no. Syracuse. I see them in Buffalo. I see them. I saw them in New York City. Um, a few all weeks over. ago. Um, um, as a little table at a restaurant for by the door for while you were waiting for your seat. So yeah. we're definitely expanding rapidly. Are there particular ginger beers that you really like to combo as a mule? I love goslings. Um there's some are too spicy for me. Like I, I was saying this to my boyfriend the other day, we went out to dinner for my birthday and he got a Loganberry mule and I got a bourbon smash. And the guy thought that we ordered the other drinks too. He's like, here's the mule. I'm like, oh no, 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 that's for him. <laughs> but thank you though. Um, and it was just too spicy. It was like, I don't want to say Barnett's like, it was something with a B, but Gosling's is very sweet and smooth. And I don't think it has a lot of like ginger spiciness to it. So I always go for Goslings oh with like that little seal guy on it. I think it has. I yeah. love that one. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So that's like my go-to. Aaron said Fever Tree in the comments. And I I don't think I've had Fever Tree ginger beer, but I love their tonic. I love their tonic. tonic. Their tonic is amazing, but the Fever Tree. So I like the spicier, the better. Okay. And, and it is spicy, but it's just, it's so good. I love it. No, yeah, it's I'm just like... I don't know why, no. just spicy in me just like aren't, it doesn't agree with me and it burns my throat when I'm drinking it and everyone's like, yeah, but it's, you're drinking bourbon too. I'm like, right, but this is like a different kind of like spicy to me. So I'm not huge on mules. I like them. I will say it. And like, I like it with the apple pie because it sweetens it up a little bit, but yeah, Fever Tree is a good, I love their tonic. So I assume their ginger beer is probably amazing too. So I was wow. using with alcohol in it for a very long time. And every time I would serve uh, my other half one, it would take like two and he was done. I'm like, yep. I, don't, I don't understand. Yeah. He had been buying fever tree that does not have, it's not alcohol in the ginger beer. Yeah. And so um, if you do combine them, just make sure you check because you don't need as many as you would without. <laughs> yeah. So Gosling's is sold at, it's sold at retail stores, but also liquor stores. If you're buying it from a liquor store, it has to have alcohol in it. So it has, I think like 1% alcohol. So just keep an eye on that too. I didn't know that either. And I was like, how is this store like able to sell ginger beer? And they're like, oh, it has alcohol in it. And I'm like, huh, I didn't know that. So that's definitely a thing. That might vary by state because I'm in Connecticut and I also shop in Rhode Island because I'm on the Connecticut yeah. Rhode Island border and it's okay. in the mixer section, which is all alcohol free. So it's with your cranberry juices and yeah, it and could be. I know New York state is like really wonky about their rules with like liquor and only being able to sell liquor in a liquor store, which is like weird, but also they can sell Bloody Mary mix, but they can't sell other certain things. Like they can't do actual mixers like soda water or anything like that, or like tonic, unless it's has alcohol in it. New York state has weird laws. I, I genuinely don't understand how the SLA works, but I've heard from other people, like some states, their beer and liquor store are one or their liquors in a grocery store. And I'm like, I would love to live in a state like that because it just seems like it'd be a lot easier. For the home of Wegmans, but for those of you who have your wine store and your Wegmans in, as one, I truly envy you. Yes, 100%. <laughs> yes. And, and everyone, just so you know, when I sent these to you in the mail, I was sending you bubbles. So, you have bubbles. <laughs> awesome okay well if no one else has any questions rachel thank you so much yeah. for having us today not a problem guys i appreciate you having me we've done beer we've done wine and now we've done um bourbon whiskey i think um next is tequila so if you right. <laughs> now you guys can do tequila so if you've been following along with us um keep an eye out for that that's coming up next um, and then I do know I've got a couple of people who I owe emails to after this for the specifically around replication 
um, with AWS, um, with Veeam for AWS. So uh, we will send out a recording um, and you will also receive the recipes. I'll make sure that I send those out to everyone as well um, from Iron Smoke. Thanks for hopping on. If anyone has any questions, my email is here. You'll also have it, um, you'll get an email from me. You can just respond back to, and I will reach out to those who wanted to see demos and have specific questions around um, disaster recovery and replication. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Have a great afternoon. Fantastic. Awesome. Glad thank you guys liked it. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.